Charles Albert Thompson was a 52-year-old from Fair Play, California. He had children and lived with his father. On Friday, October 2nd, 2015, Charles left for a weekend of partying in Jackson. On Sunday morning, the 4th, Charles talked to someone on the phone, the topic being that Charles would be home that evening. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Most people will recognize those lyrics immediately. The song won a Grammy for Record of the Year in 1978. Guitarist Magazine ranked the solo in that song the best of all time. And yours truly might have even sung it at a karaoke party in Las Vegas circa 2001. Maybe. <clears throat> Although there could be different meanings of the song, a popular literal one is that a drifter after a long day of traveling finds a place to stop for the night, and upon entering the premises, he descends, much like Alice in Wonderland or the Twilight Zone, into a world that is somewhat like a dream, or more appropriately, a nightmare. And no matter how hard this person tries to escape, he can't. A more figurative interpretation is that it's about drug addiction, something the band that wrote that song would have known a bit about at the time. That the building is a reference to being encompassed by addiction, and that no matter how hard a person tries to get sober, she can't, at least not while alive. Hence the double meaning of the phrase, check out, I read above. Well, in the disappearance of Charles Thompson, he was a traveler, getting a ride from Fair Play, California, to Jackson. He had a long-time drug addiction, and he checked into a place for the weekend, maybe even a place he had slept at before. But this place was no hotel. Nothing as fancy as in that Eagle song. Then Charles was gone, and we're left to wonder if he ever really did check out of Motel, California. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. Charles Thompson was a funny guy. So says his family. And they would know, since the Thompsons and other offshoots of Charles's family all lived in a very concentrated area of El Dorado County, California. They'd get together for birthdays and holidays with everyone's children growing up together. Charles had two kids of his own, although they didn't live with him. He, in fact, lived with his father and had done so for many years. However, all was not perfect in Charles's life. Despite having a job, he had been to jail more than once. He had a drug addiction, and he hung around people who would not allow him to leave that lifestyle, even if he wanted to. They'd get together one weekend a month to party it up, going out of town to do so. So on Friday, October 2nd, 2015, the party weekend was about to start. Charles told his father he was going to help a young woman, Julie, move. Charles never told his father the truth about his drug activities. Another woman, Brenda, picked Charles up, and they left. Charles spoke to someone on the phone Saturday the 3rd, then during the morning of Sunday the 4th. Everything seemed fine, with Charles saying he would be home later that Sunday evening. Yet, Charles never came home. He was never seen again. Phone and credit card records determined Charles spent that weekend at a motel in Jackson, California. However... 
There's no concrete proof as to who joined Charles or where he went after he checked out, or even if he really did check out. Unfound has a long history of covering disappearances where drugs and addiction could be a factor. These cases bring out the widest range of unbelievable stories and sketchy theories. However, for Charles's case, these questions dominate the conversation. Number one, why did the girl Charles was supposed to help move come over to his house that Friday after he left, saying she wanted to clean his house? Number two, why did the drug acquaintances who knew Charles best say he went to Jackson with people they didn't know when they all ran in the same circles? And number three, is it a coincidence that the last ping from Charles's phone happened very close to the house of a man who Charles had known for many years? Charles's family, of course, hopes he is alive. However, given the time span and Charles's addiction, they realize the chances are slim. The guest for this episode is Charles Thompson's niece, Amberlyn Rome. Unfound news. It's past July 1st, so you know what that means. You should have received your unfound newsletter a couple days ago. If you did, I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, contact me and I'll put you on the list. This one contained my thoughts about the recovery of Esther Westenbarger and her car, and also how we can learn a lot from the killing spree of the original Night Stalker and apply that knowledge to disappearances. Next, I recorded the first Unfound Now last week, the disappearance of Linda Stoltfus. It's now available on YouTube. I hope you liked it and that you found it informative. It went way longer than I wanted, and I'm going to have to work on keeping it more concise for future recordings. But I think I captured the principal idea in the first try. I'm not going to do a lot of theorizing. I'm just going to show you how we at Unfound analyze new disappearances. Unfortunately, Linda is still missing. Finally, for premium Patreon members, the next Unfound on the ground will be happening July 13th at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time. I hope everyone who is available will tune in. In addition, I hope some of you will consider becoming a Patreon supporter for the first time. You can do so at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, Deezer, and Facebook. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube for the Unfound live show. All of you can talk with me, and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound, the niece of Charles Thompson, Amberlyn Rome. Amberlyn, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Hello. Let's start here. Uh, you are Charles's niece. Why don't you tell the listeners uh, a little bit about yourself and then explain how you are the person – uh, who was talking to me about his disappearance. How, how did that all happen? Um, okay. Um, I, me and my uncle have been close my entire life. Um, I'm the fourth generation growing up here in Somerset, California. Um, I've always lived one mile away from him. And um, he, when he went missing, I was the one that filed the police report and just kind of took charge in talking to people, huh. and uh, yeah, I was contacted, um, I think, by your assistant to mm -hmm. 
get mm-hmm. a little bit of information right. about the whole situation, and that's how me and you began to right. talk. That's exactly that's exactly right. Uh, that's how Amberlynn and I uh, began to talk. You should know, Amberlynn, that we don't have many nieces on the program. We have a lot of parents, a lot of siblings, a lot of children. Uh, you're one of the few nieces of a missing person, so I think that's uh, fairly uh, interesting to the listeners. Uh, do you think it was because you two were so close? Obviously, I, I, I'm guessing maybe that he has children of his own, maybe he has siblings, but it ended up being you. Yes. Yeah, my my mom it w- wasn't emotionally, um, I guess, stable enough mm-hmm. to talk or do everything, and she's very shy, so, and I knew they were very close. So, I mean, they're mm-hmm. about maybe a year and a half apart, and they were growing up, like, basically like twins. So, mm-hmm. I just knew how much it affected her, and I just, I knew I had to step in and wow. do something for her. <laughs> okay. Well, later in the, uh, in our talk here, after we talk about all the details and everything, we're going to revisit uh, that topic again just to talk about how, you know, this has affected you, you know, and I'm, I'm sure, okay. I'm guessing that... Uh, back before 2015 happened, you could have never guessed that you would be doing something in in your life like this. So I just want to uh, maybe go through that later. You know, how has this all affected you? You know, not not just you personally, but maybe your relationship with other, you know, your other loved ones. Okay, so we'll talk about that later. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Charles. You said that uh, you were you were close to him. You didn't live that. Uh, far away from him. What are do you think are some of the you know when you think of Charles now about his maybe his personality and uh, you know what comes to mind? Uh, he was funny, funny so guy. funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> uh, he's very protective, very mm-hmm. protective of us. Mm-hmm. And. And just did everything for family and friends, anybody he cared about, he would he would take care of. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean overall he was he was funny. <laughs> okay. Um, what kind of person, uh, funny uh, sense of humor did he have? Was he like a practical joker, or did he like to tell jokes, or you know, was he like a um, he, like a class clown type of person? Joker. What do you think? What, do you think? <laughs> what would you say? Uh, he was very much of a practical joker. Was he? Picked on you, you know, and almost to your breaking point. But then he would feel guilty, and he was he was funny. <laughs> uh huh. It was that. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, something that is common in your family, or would you say he was unique in that respect? Uh, he was unique, and yeah, mm-hmm. very unique, loud, okay. and outspoken. <laughs> okay. All right, so he was a practical joker, uh, and I, I, I'm guessing that he pulled those jokes not on just you, and but maybe other people in your family, if he has other nieces and nephews. Oh, yes, yep, everybody, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, <laughs> parents. Okay, that's that's uh, pretty neat. Um, I should ask you this, not that I would ever ask you your age, but how much uh, age difference was there between you and uh, your Uncle Charles? Uh, I think 24, 24 20, years. 24 years, okay. So, yeah, yeah he was a, a, like an age that he could have been a, a parent with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you still were two or still close. Yes, yeah, okay. very. And it's your mother who is his sister. Yes, correct. Okay, and uh, what was their relationship, if you feel comfortable saying, what kind of relationship did they have, very much like yours, very close to him? Yes, yeah, yeah, very close. My mom would, did everything for him. Any, mm. you know, he, anytime he would call, she, no matter where he was, if he needed help, anything, she, she was there, they were there for each other. Mm-hmm. And and did you all live? Uh, we should maybe say that even though it's uh, considered that he disappeared from Jackson, California, is that where all of you lived in that area, or did all your family live in that area or uh, somewhere else? Um, we 
we grew up in Jackson, and they grew up in Jackson, but then we all, um, when my mom and um, Charles were little, uh, they actually moved up to Somerset in uh, Fair Play, California, um, mm. and uh, the first seven years of my life, I grew up in Amador, Jackson, and then uh, moved here on the property of my grandparents uh, in Fair Play, and all of their children ended up moving in a house on the property, so we wow. all live here on the property. <laughs> wow, so a lot of the uh, uh, Thompson, Rome, whatever other last names are, all live very close to each other, very close. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you get yep, together yep. for four, like four out of the five kids. <laughs> okay, so um, you get together for like Thanksgivings, Christmases, birthdays. Yep. Wow. Yep. Yep. Everything. That sounds fantastic. Okay, let's talk about uh, Charles's work that he had uh, as an adult. Obviously, with that kind of age difference, you didn't know him when he was in high school or anything, but. So let's just talk about when you became, let's just say, a young adult, and he would have been 24 years older uh, than you mm-hmm. were. What did he do for work, for money? What was what did he do? Uh, I've always known him to uh, do like wood cutting and tree work and mm-hmm. kind of odd jobs like that. Mhm. And yeah, vineyard work, um, weed eating, but mostly I've always known him to. Work with trees. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll give you an example. Like, say a tree comes down on a power line, would he be one of the guys that gets called out there to take it down? Something like that? Uh, no, it, it was more, I guess, in the town kind of mm-hmm. um, work. He didn't actually have a business or work for a, a company. He yeah. he was just known and kind of did the under the table odd jobs for. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's what he was doing uh, at the time of his disappearance? Yes. All right. Yep. Did, so is he still working for himself, or did he have a supervisor or uh, a boss? Or? Nope. Yep. Still just, yeah, works for himself. Okay. All right. Um, where was he living at the time? What was his living situation around the time of his disappearance? Uh, he lived with my grandpa in the house with my grandpa. Okay. And yeah, his dad. Okay, and just the two of them, or any others? Nope. Yep, yeah, just the two of them. Okay. Um, children. Did uh, Charles have any children from any marriages, relationships? Uh, yeah, he had a, a daughter and a son from um, his previous wife. Okay, and did they also live in the area that you're talking about, or did they live elsewhere? Uh, his his daughter lived in uh, Colorado, hmm. um, and his son in Folsom. Folsom, California. Okay. Uh, yeah. You, do you um, did do you know if they saw him often? Did he keep in touch with them? They have a good relationship. Yes. Yeah. He was actually. He was. Him and his son talked um, a couple times a week. Uh, he would talk to his daughter, I believe. He tried to talk to her every single night, but he was mm. planning, before he disappeared, he was planning a trip to go to Colorado mm. um, to visit, yeah, and because his daughter was going to have a baby, so he was wow. going to be able to, yeah, be a part of that. Of course. Uh, would that have been his first grandchild? Yes. Yep, oh, yep, his first one. Okay, so he has these two children. Uh, I'm guessing maybe they're close to your age, kind of? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. His daughter is a year older than me, and his son is about two years younger than me. Okay. So he's living with his father. How long had that been going on? A while? Or? Um, Quite a while. Um, mm-hmm. Probably, gosh, I would say like, honestly, at least. 25 years wow, I know wow, of. Okay. I don't, okay. Yeah, I've only known him, yeah, to, with his previous wife, my cousin's aunt, or uh, my aunt, my cousin's mm-hmm. mother. Um, I only remember, like, maybe, like, the first five years of my life of them actually being together, and then after mm-hmm. that, he's always lived with my grandpa. Wow. Well, I got to give uh, Charles credit, because I, I, my father's still alive, my mother's deceased, but 
I couldn't imagine living with my dad for 25 years as an adult. So I got to I got to give credit to both to both of them. Okay. Um, did he once he got divorced or whatever happened? Uh, any girlfriends that were in his life specifically near the time of his disappearance that that you know of? No, none. Yeah. None. None at all. Not doing, yep. not doing none at any all, dating. We, yeah. Not going out with any women. Not, okay. No, not that he. Yeah, not that I knew of. That was like mm. anything serious. Just had a lot of friends. <laughs> Women friends. Women friends, yes. <laughs> okay, so no uh, steady one-on-one -on -one relationship that you know of. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, not that I know All of. All right, so he's not married. Uh, doesn't sound like he has a girlfriend. Has women friends. Maybe he's just playing the field. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Any problems with any of those women at the time that you know of his disappearance? Any like women that he was spending time with that maybe a guys were jealous, anything like that that you've ever heard? Oh, no, no, nothing before his disappearance. Nothing had ever come up before that. Okay. So yeah. he uh, has this job. He's uh, uh, getting paid, like you said, under the table, possibly doing some tree work, uh, something that sounds like he'd been doing for a while. He's living at home. Uh, with his father, they've been doing it for a long time, so it seems they get they're getting along uh, just fine. Of course, living uh, with another person, whether it's your parent or not, of course, cuts down on the expenses. And um, okay, so those are some of the things, and he has a good relationship with his kids. Now let's talk about a couple mm -hmm. things that uh, about him uh, that uh, maybe I'm not here to judge, but some things that uh, we have to talk about. Um, uh -huh. did he have a bipolar disorder? That is in some of the publications out there that I've read. Is that true? Do you know that for a fact? What can you say about it? Yes. Yeah, he was diagnosed uh, he was. bipolar. Uh, my entire life that I know of, he had always he'd been diagnosed. Okay. Uh, so that you're saying that he had been diagnosed a, a long time ago, maybe even possibly before you were born? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh do you know if that if he uh, do you know if he consistently took his medicine, his medication or not? Uh yeah, my my mom said that he was consistently taking his medication whether he was mm. taking it correctly, but he was taking it. What does that mean correctly? Maybe you're going to have to uh, I you're going to have to probably explain that at least a little bit correctly. What does that mean? Um, he, he got to the point where he was, like, smashing his, and snorting his pills rather than oh. just taking them with some water. Yeah. Uh, any particular reason? I mean, I guess that you know about this. I guess he was doing this in front of other people. Is there a reason that he... Uh, he told my mom. Yeah, he told my mom about it, and, because she would ask him to make sure that he was still on his medication and, you know... Helped him, re, you know, get it refilled and whatnot. But he, mm -hmm. yeah, he said that he had moved on to that, to that he liked the effects. I guess the happy effects that it gave him, but snorting it gave mm -hmm. it to him faster or better. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you, over the course of your life uh, and being around him, and of course you being close to him, did you ever experience him when he was having? When he was off his medication, can you even explain might have how he might have acted if he wasn't on his medication? Did you ever experience that? Yes, yeah, a couple times. Um, okay. He he would trade his medication for harder drugs, so mm -hmm. it was always he was off his medication, but also doing the hard drugs without his medication. He would he would go nuts. He would he wasn't nice. Well, He'd be violent. He would be right. yeah. He would hide in trees. And wow. Yeah, and he was very sneaky, and yeah, I would like break into his own house to get into his bedroom to go to sleep, even though he didn't have to. But he was just was not himself at all. Wow. And then what would happen? How would he get back on track? Uh, we we would have to end up calling the local sheriff, and they would mm -hmm. take him in, and he would either have to go to a progress house or just, I guess wait until he was everything was out of his system and 
they would release him and he would go back. My mom would take him back to his mental health doctor and reassess and re-prescribe and Okay. Yeah, did you ever, yeah. or anybody who, you know, loved him, uh, did they ever talk to him about these episodes? Like, you know, do you remember what you did last week? I mean, does he, would he have a recollection of this thing going, these things happening, or how, how would he talk about them? No, not that, I, honestly, now I don't, not that I remember. It was never brought back up or spoken about, at least not that I know of or in front of me. Mm-hmm. Or I've never heard him apologize or talk about it ever afterwards. Okay. You never asked him about it. Hey, Uncle Charles, you know you kind of lost it last week. You know what? what, what no, the, never brought it. Yeah, up. it was always just kind of a that's an Uncle Charles thing. Like I, yeah, okay. and like I guess I just felt so guilty for him that he had an issue, and that since we were so close, I. Mm-hmm. Maybe just I, I didn't want to hurt his feelings by bringing it up, but sure. I don't think anyone ever has. Okay. Uh, how often do you, would you say that this would happen? Um, it that when I, as I got older, um, I would say like uh, I've seen it happen. I think three times, so and that was in like within a ten year span. All right, so not um so. That's not very common. Yeah, so once every three years. Is, yeah, it wasn't is like at least once a year or nothing or once a month. Yeah. Just. Okay. Okay. Well, all right. Well, that doesn't, I mean, you don't like it, you know, and you worry about somebody, you know, that would have those, that happen to them. Uh, but once every three years maybe is not as big a deal as some of the other things we've heard on the program. Okay. Now, you've already mentioned that sometimes he traded his bipolar medication for harder drugs. Um, mm-hmm. Were you uh, aware of this before he disappeared? Did everybody in the family know that this was going on? or uh, Everyone except for like, his dad, yeah. We all knew. Okay. Yes. And when you say harder drugs, what do you mean? Um, like meth, mm-hmm. um, crank. Uh, maybe a different, just a different kind of pill. Mm-hmm. Like maybe uh, I'm pretty sure there's a couple times like Oxycontin, okay, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so this is just something that was uh, accepted. Like you said, though, you don't think that his father, your grandfather, knew. Do you know if Charles ever sought help for that? And tried to go to rehab? Uh, only when he was forced to. Like, okay. legally, I don't, yeah, I personally don't ever remember or know mm-hmm. of him willingly volunteering or asking. Okay. Okay. Um, do you, I would never ask you to say a name, but uh, did you and your family know where he was getting this from, the people, you know, who? who... No, not personally. No, mm-hmm. we just just knew it was around town and. And he had a lot of friends around town. <laughs> okay. All right. So he has this uh, bipolar condition that maybe he, um, once in a while, once every three years, let's say, kind of uh, would need some help for that. And police would need to show up. And then on top of that, uh, he had this addiction or, you know, he would do meth or some other drug uh, in trading for his bi- bipolar medication. Or maybe he would just get it outright. With money, so he was uh, doing that. Now you told me uh, you probably have to explain this a little bit that he would go away uh, one weekend a month uh, in regards to this drug activity. Uh, can you explain that to the listeners? Yeah, he would um, get his social security money at the beginning of each month, and um, it kind of became a routine that we knew about that he would just spend the the three days, that first weekend of the month, um, out with friends. And he would always, Friday to Sunday, and he would always be back on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it just became, yeah, a monthly routine. And we never saw anything else of it and mm-hmm. figured he, he lived this long and got away with this much that, you know. Mm-hmm. 
didn't expect anything to happen. <laughs> right. Okay. I, I get that. You, the, there's no doubt that uh, family members who have an addict, you know, can get lulled, lulled into a false sense of security. Well, they always did this and nothing ever happened, and then something, you know, of course, you know, a lot of times eventually does happen. Um, do you know how long this had been going on, how many years he had been doing these one uh, weekend, uh, a month getaways with uh, these drug friends of his? Uh, honestly, as far back as I remember, um, wow. <laughs> pretty much my whole adult life, if he wasn't in a program or in prison mm. or in jail, it was that was his routine. Okay. Um, yeah, and the thing is, he had a routine, so mm -hmm. it was work and those three days straight gone, and yeah, that was that was him. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you say that these weekends over the span of time were always with? Once again, I know you weren't there. But do you know mm -hmm. that if it, it, these were the same people all the time? Were they different people? Were these familiar people familiar to you that you would see? How would you explain it? No, um, they they weren't familiar to me. Like I mean, I I heard names, different names, just growing up and everything, and from other locals that had grown up and still stayed here. I've known their names, but it was there were so many names and so many people that he knew that. And we never knew if they were real people or real mm -hmm. names that he was telling us. But, um, yeah, I personally did not know them. Um, I don't I don't even think my mom mm -hmm. really knew most of them, except okay. for the people they, they had actually grown up with. Okay. Now, you'd also told me, though, that uh, although you and most of the members of your family kind of knew what was going on, uh, you told mm -hmm. me that he would give an excuse to his father, your grandfather. He wouldn't tell him outright, hey, I'm going away for the weekend to party with people. He would come up with some other explanations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would just it would always be I'm helping somebody move, somebody needs my help, or I'm I'm going here. I may spend the night, I may not. So if I don't come home, don't worry. But, and it, yeah, okay. my, my grandpa, I mean, he would always worry, but... Yeah, he wouldn't just outright tell him what he was doing. Okay. And do you know uh, where Charles would go for these weekends? Did it, Once again, I know you weren't there, but from what you understand, or what you've even learned since, uh, his disappearance, mm -hmm. uh, would he stay in town? Would he go out of town? Do you... uh, yeah, uh, most of the time I, I know he, I guess right before his disappearance, he was mostly hanging out. Um, he was hanging out with my nephew a lot up in West Point, mm -hmm. um, and then he would hang out a little bit. Uh, he had a lot of friends in River Pines, which is the next town over, and then he had his friends, um, uh, Chris and Brenda, that were the locals that we knew the names of and where mm -hmm. they lived, and we knew he hung out there. Okay. So we have some names there, at least some first names, and some of these names are going to pop up uh, later. But um, so these are some of the people that were hanging out with Charles on these weekends uh, that he would get away, and it sounds like it, it varied. Towns varied, locations varied, people varied. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's move up. So we now know a little bit about Charles, what was going on uh, in in his life. And so let's move up a little bit to the days and weeks before his disappearance. Uh, my understanding is he was actually out on parole at the time of his disappearance. Why was he in jail in the first place? How did he get out? Maybe you better explain that to the listeners. Uh, he was uh, in prison. He had, uh, I think he was there for a little over a year. He had had one of his episodes. Um, Okay. of being off his medication and, I guess, coming down or off of a harder drug. And he had actually made terrorist threats to uh, his brother and his brother's wife. And um, then he resisted arrest and barricaded himself in a trailer. And, oh yeah, 
Oh, my. <laughs> okay. And how long was he in jail? I I think a little over a year he was in there. Did you ever go visit him while he was there? No, no. Nah. You didn't? Nope, I was, yeah, never allowed to, so okay. not even as an adult, I did not. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you share, like, uh, letters with him or anything? Uh, uh, when I was younger, uh, we would write letters, and then I was allowed to talk to him on the phone, but the one thing was um, my mom just told me I was never allowed to ask where he was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so really growing up, I never knew truly where he was until I was an adult, um, but uh, as an adult, we didn't um, we didn't write letters or speak on the phone whenever he went to jail or rehab. Um, I would just see him when he, he was able uh, to visit. Um, if he was in a program and he was allowed to visit with a supervisor, um, like during holidays or whatever. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, after that, I didn't really keep in the contact when he was in jail like I did growing up. So are you saying that when he was in jail for this this la- this final time, you went for a year without talking to him? Yes. Without any yeah. communication yeah, we- with him? Yeah, we pretty much all of us did. I think he he called my mom like like once a month, um, and then he would call my grandpa. I think once a week. Um, okay. He really he he didn't want to once he was in there, and he didn't want to drag people. I think he was almost learning a lesson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And the fact that, I mean, the collect calls, my mom finally told him that they cost too much. So. <laughs> okay. Um, are you saying then that this was not his first stay in, in jail? No, no, not at all. Okay, so you've no. been in jail. Uh, was it, once again, the way you understand it, was it for drug offenses or similar things to what he did this time, resisting arrest, et cetera, or what? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. the same, same thing every time. <laughs> okay. All right. So kind of uh, once again, in your adult life, how, ma- how much of the time uh, w- did he spend in jail once you turned, let's say, 18? How many of those years do you remember him being in jail? Um, I'd probably – like maybe three, maybe three or four, maybe – he was, he was very good at getting out of things. <laughs> okay, three or four years, or yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. So yeah, uh, um, yeah, a couple of parole violations and wow. Okay, so yeah. how long was he out of jail before he disappeared? Do you remember? Um, about a year. All right. Just about a year. So he was uh, keeping his nose clean, I guess, as they say. That's pretty good mm-hmm. to get out yeah, of jail yeah. and stay out yeah, for a year. Yeah, he was good for a minute. You know, given that he was uh, seemed to be prone to uh, some addic- uh, addictive habits that could have certainly mm-hmm. put him right back in jail because it was illegal. All right, uh, so he's out on parole for a year. He's back to working. He's living at home. You're seeing him. Now looking back at it now. Of course, it's mm-hmm. going to be five years this October, but looking back at it now and those – Days and weeks before he disappeared, is there anything that really jumped out, jumps out at you? Something maybe you didn't realize at the time of his disappearance, but all these years later, look back and say, man, that, you know, now that I think about it, that was a little weird. Anything at all? Um, no, nothing that he did that would, like, I mean, we've always known he, he you know, he would make people upset um, around mm-hmm. town. Um, but nothing that like really stood out. Okay. That would, yeah. We, I was surprised that it didn't happen sooner with in his life. <laughs> um, you're so just so I'm clear on that. You're surprised that did, did his disappearance didn't or something mm-hmm. like that uh, didn't happen mm-hmm. sooner because of the problems that he did have going to jail. His drug issues, et yeah, and, and also the people that he was hanging around that it didn't happen earlier. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right, but nothing that stands out. Okay. No, nothing that stands out. 
Okay, let's move on to this then. We're just going to talk about a few people in general now. I'm just going to give you some names. I'm only going to use uh -huh. one last name because we're going to find out this guy's last name anyway, but we're just going to use first names uh -huh. um, for the rest of the people. Just We're not going to talk about them in detail, just in general. Who is Brenda? Uh -huh. uh, Brenda is a, a friend of um, my Uncle Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, she, he was friends with, yeah, her, her and her husband. Um, he would go over there quite often mm -hmm. and hang out. And yeah, he um, is it, at least that's Brenda's a uh, uh, person that he would do his drugs with. Uh, the, yeah, okay. yeah, okay, yeah, she was known. Okay, do you have any idea how they knew each other? Was she around his age? Did they go to high school together, or you know? Um, it's as far as I know, yeah, he just met her kind of through other people in town that had lived, been living here for a while. Okay. And who is Brenda's? You said her her husband. Do you know who he is? Um, he uh, Chris. Chris Ross. Christopher Ross. All right, that's the guy we're going to use uh -huh. his last name. Um, uh -huh. Who is he? We'll get into his, very, him very specifically later. But who in general is he, once again, another person that Charles did drugs with? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you ever meet Chris, uh, Your per you personally, Chris or Brenda? Uh, no. No, I have never personally met them. My mom has, but I have not. Okay. Who is Julie? Uh, Julie is um, a a very good friend of my of Uncle Charles. Um, uh, his one of his very good friends um, is, is his daughter. And uh, wow, yeah, he's known her for years and years and years. And but yeah, has known her dad pretty much. My whole family knows her dad and his family and kind of a family that grown up together okay and what is uh, i don't have it on the list here but what is uh her father's name uh j j j ball j ball okay and her name uh her uh, name is julie but i don't think she goes by that last name anymore okay we're just going to use her first yeah name. and who is mm -hmm. sean uh sean was uh my uncle's a uh, good friend and Julie's boyfriend at the time. Okay. Do you know, uh, are are these four people, were they all friends the way you understand it? For example, did Julie know Brenda? Does Sean know Chris? You know, did they all four hang out or were they like in uh, separate groups? Uh, as far as I know, they, they all knew who each other were. They, they have hung out. Um, yeah, they knew each other. Okay. And you said Brenda did, and I'm, I'm, this is something that's jumping out. Did you once tell me though, that you said Brenda and Chris were married, correct? Uh, yeah, that's how they, yeah, they introduced each other as a husband and wife. All right. But we don't know actually if they were or not, right? We don't know if there's actually. Yeah, not legally. No, uh, we don't know if there's paperwork to that effect. Nope. Yeah, we don't know that. Okay. And but did you also tell me that Julie and Chris once had a relationship as well? Yes. Yes. After her and Sean broke up. Okay. And did she act? Did she actually have a child by Chris? Uh, as far as I know, yeah. That's that's what people have said around town and told okay. us. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on. So we got these people because their names will come up late, uh, very quickly, actually. But um, the way you understand it, though, those four people minus Jay, were they all quite a bit younger? Of course, we have to remember Charles was in his 50s. Um, mm -hmm. Were these people all quite a bit younger than Charles? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the oldest was Brenda, and she was in her maybe early 40s. Late thirties, maybe early forties, and um, and then Julie, the youngest, she was in her probably early to mid twenties, um, mm -hmm. as far as I know. 
Okay. Uh, maybe just mid twenties, yeah. And then Chris and Sean in between, both Julie and Brenda. All right. So Charles was hanging out with these people who were quite a bit younger than he was, and your understanding is when he mm-hmm. would go away for these once again, this once a month weekends. These are some of the people that he might have spent those weekends with. Yes. As a possibility. Yeah. I know you, once again, I keep saying this for the listeners, I know you weren't there, but that's your understanding. Mm-hmm. That's also your mother's understanding. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we have these people that were in Charles's uh, life. You're going to find out a little bit more about him, them in a second. So we move up to uh, the day of October 2nd, 2015, which is a Friday. And what do you understand the sequence of events were that Friday starting? I don't know if Charles went to work. Maybe you want to start there. Did he go to work? Did he come home? Um, What do you understand about the sequence of events regarding Charles and his movements that Friday? Um, Yeah, as far as I know, uh, he went to work in the morning, um, came home um, in the later afternoon, um, and – uh, was telling my grandpa about um, how later he was going to help Julie move. Hmm. Um, and, yeah, that he was going to get picked up and he was going to go help Julie move. Um, and as far as I know, um, a woman came and picked him up. She was dark complected, and he introduced her to my grandpa as Brenda. Okay. Um, and then he left. Um, and then, according to my grandpa, uh, a girl came into his house and, and said that she was Julie and that Charles sent her there to clean his house. And my grandpa had no idea what she was talking about. Huh, um, so, so he ended up kicking her out. Okay. Yeah. So Charles and, says that he's um, going to help Julie move. He leaves with Brenda to go allegedly do that. And then right after that, Julie, who is allegedly moving, shows up saying she wants to clean – uh, George and his father's house, or Charles and his father's house. Yes. Wow. And um, so your grandfather didn't allow her to do that. No, he did not. Okay, and I, I guess you have you talked to your. I don't know. You see, your grandfather's still alive. Yes, he is. Okay, and you've had a chance to talk to him about it. How? You know, how did he explain it to you? Did he get, like, a weird feeling about it, or had this ever happened before where she stopped by to say she was going to clean? How did he explain it? No, he, he said he had he'd never seen this young girl before. Uh, he was very upset. He knew that she was lying because mm-hmm. uh, he said, you know, my, my uncle would never do that, especially without telling him or without his permission. Um, and, yeah, he, he just knew that she was she must have been up to no good and, not telling the truth. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he was very upset. Okay. So we have to also establish something else maybe about these weekends. It's your understanding when, when Charles would go on to these weekends, uh, he would usually drive himself. He would take his vehicle, maybe at a truck. Yes. Yeah, he would always. Always. But this particular October 2nd, Brenda, once again a woman we've already explained kind of who she is, she came and picked him up and left his vehicle there. Yes. Okay. So that was uh that was unique. Uh did Charles take any clothes with him, any toiletries like a toothbrush or anything like that when he left? Nothing. Nothing. Do you uh is that how he usually behaved when he was going away for a weekend or would he usually take things? Um, you know, honestly, I I don't know if he would usually take things. I would think so, like maybe Usually he would have stuff in his truck, mm-hmm. um, but this time he took nothing, not his dog, not his truck, nothing. Okay. He did take his phone, though? He did take his phone. Yep, he took his phone and he took his wallet. Okay. All right, so he leaves with Brenda. Maybe this looks like it's going to be, once again, one of those weekends. You've already explained that he would make up excuses to go on these weekends. I mm-hmm. wouldn't exactly be telling the truth, and at least on this Friday – it seems like it's another one of those situations. However, he didn't take his vehicle this time. And on top of that, this girl Julie 
who once again is a daughter of a guy that Charles knows, she shows up wanting to clean the place seemingly for no reason, and we'll get into maybe why uh, she showed up here in a moment. So things continue through Friday. Uh, anything happen on Saturday? Does Charles talk to anybody? Does anybody call him, text him uh, on Saturday, October 3rd? Um, Saturday, um, I believe, is the day that he, he called his son, um, and he left his um, son a message. Um, he called his sister, my mom, um, but she wasn't available to answer. Um, and I do believe he got a phone call from uh, his nephew, Robert. Um, and as far as we know, my nep uh, his nephew was calling to see if he could help him with, I think, cutting wood on Sunday to make a little bit of money. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, as far as I know, that was what happened on Saturday. Okay. And then, um, and yeah, I have to ask you if I, day, if uh, I could just ask you a question about that. At that point on on Saturday, when he talked to these people, did Charles ever say where he was? Was he in your area? Was he in some other area of California? Was he in a car riding somewhere? Did he ever say? No, he he never never said where he was or who he was with or what his next plan was, nothing. Okay. But we do have verification that he was alive and well, being that people – it wasn't – I guess what I'm saying is it wasn't a text situation where somebody – anybody could have been texting. Somebody actually heard his voice that Saturday. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we get to Sunday uh, once again uh, regarding the the phone. Uh, anybody mm -hmm. talk to Ch uh, Charles that day? Anybody? Um, yeah, my uh, his nephew, my cousin Robert, actually called him back that morning. Got a hold of him um, that my mom was telling me, and um, but my. Uh, he offered him to, if they wanted to make money, he had some woodwork um, to help him with. And, he, and my uncle said that he was going to call him back to see about it, but he never called back. And mm -hmm. he did try and call my mom, but he was one number off. All right. We're, all right. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So there is proof mm -hmm. that from Charles's phone, he tried to call your mother, but there, it was one number off. Yes, yep, the very last number was off. All right, so what you're saying, so the last number, or I don't know her phone number, but let's just say the last number is a four. He dialed a five instead, or a three. Yes, yeah, correct. Okay, so I don't know what to make of that, but there is at least proof that, once again, somebody heard his voice that Sunday, October 4th. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Was Charles's father expecting Mac as usually was the case that Sunday evening, October fourth? Yes. Yep. We all were. Okay. Yeah. All right. But uh, obviously, he does not come home uh, that night. Um, what mm -hmm. does your your grandfather do? Uh, does he let anybody like your mother or you know that Charles didn't get home? I mean. Were the red flags going up that Sunday evening, or how would you explain that Sunday evening when Charles doesn't show up? Yeah, he, he called my mom um, later in the night, my grandpa did, um, to let her know that he still was at home. And my mom tried to reassure him, you know, give him till tomorrow. Um, don't worry. Tonight, you know, just give him till tomorrow. Um, and then the next day, still wasn't home. So my mom said, okay, well, you know, we'll give him. Today, we'll all try and get a hold of them, uh, and if we, you know, by the end of the day, if we can't, then mm -hmm. we'll end up calling the sheriff. Did anybody try calling Charles' phone uh, that evening to see why he wasn't yes. home yet? Or Okay. I, yes, my, my mom did um, try and call him, and, um, yeah, he wasn't answering. It was going straight to voicemail like it was shut off. Um, and uh, I don't believe my mom left him a message. Mm -hmm. uh, she she has never said that she did. She just knows that she called him and he didn't answer. And 
She was worried for my grandpa, but I, I don't think she was worried that something happened to him because she didn't, you know, right. expect anything of to course. happen to him. <laughs> of course, nobody does. Okay. So what you're saying is besides this person, uh, a nephew who spoke to Charles in the morning, there was no communications, at least that you know of, with Charles after that. Correct. Okay. Did, has your nephew ever said, did did Charles give the impression that he would be home that evening? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was nothing. Yeah, he didn't say otherwise, and there was no... I guess the message that he left his son on Saturday, there was no distress in that, and figured, you know, the next day he was he was going to be there by the evening like he always was. Okay. So we come to Monday. Obviously, once again, Charles uh, doesn't show up. He doesn't show up for his work. Um, what happens that Monday? The wheels, I guess, gears start getting turned on, you know, what happened to him? What goes on? Um, yeah, he, uh, I, I'm not sure if he was even scheduled for work or if it was kind of a, I'll call you to see if you need help kind of thing. Um, cause none of his friends or, you know, employer or anything worried that Monday, uh, we were just kind of watching our phones and, you know, kept checking on my grandpa. Um, but other than that, we just kind of, kind of sat around and waited. Mm-hmm. and hoped, you know, that maybe it was just one extra day that he took. Okay. Did any of you have the phone numbers of possibly Brenda or Julie to call them and um, see what was going on? No, I know my mom, because talking to my grandpa, and my grandpa told her that um, he was helping Julie move, left with Brenda helping Julie move, is when my mom, um, I mean, trying to go through any numbers possibly that she had had in the past of any of his friends, but really she didn't have anyone, I guess, mm. that had a number in service or that she knew at that time because he had, had so many friends and she kind of stopped keeping track of them. <laughs> okay. Okay, I understand that. Uh, once again, it's not your mo- your mother's job to oversee your <laughs> uncle. You know, she has her own family, yeah. so you know it's just not her job. Get it? Uh, when are the police finally contacted? Uh, Tuesday morning. Okay, let's talk about that. What do they do? Do they? Uh, I guess a report is filed. Um, what goes on from there? Yeah, um, I had called, um, I guess, like the dispatch, um, and she said that she was going to have somebody call me to file the report, but she warned me that she didn't know what they could do because the month before, I guess, he came home later in the evening than he usually did, and my aunt, his other sister, automatically freaked out and called the police and tried to file a missing person's report. Okay. So they specifically told me that, you know, he'll probably just end up coming home, you know, the next day if we follow the report. Now, you know, there's pretty much, this is what she did last month. So, um, so I just said that, you know, it, it didn't matter. I wanted the deputy to call me anyways, and I wanted the report to be filed to at least show proof that, you know, we filed. Okay. So, yeah. Did So did you file that? Uh, was it you that gave the information? Yes, yeah, it was me. Okay. Did you do that over the phone, or did, or did a police officer show up at your place, your house? Your um, at first we did it over the phone, and then I believe it was Wednesday the next day they had actually sent a deputy out to personally interview um, us um, and my grandpa. Okay. And I guess a lot of that what we've already covered in this interview was told to the police. Yes. And then, and and also on top of that being that he had gone to jail a couple times, it could be maybe some of these police officers were already familiar with him anyway. Yes. Yeah, they were. Uh, okay. All right. So it's a combination of things going on there. Okay. Um. Do you know if uh, they were able to track down? Uh, any of these people, Julie, Brenda, Chris, Sean, did 
did the police go that far, or did they just kind of throw their hands up in the air, and what did they do? Um, they actually uh, had us go and pick up jewelry. Uh, we, my aunt ended up getting information about where Julie lived uh, through her daughter's uh, brother-in-law. I guess he was friends with her, neighbors with her, got information. It got back to my aunt. My aunt was able to tell me, you know, she lives in River Pine, um, right behind the, the store. Um, and they said, well, that's on the Amador County side, so it's, you know, not our jurisdiction. But if you guys pick her up and bring her over here to us, then we have the right to talk to her. So me and my mom went in to her house, her and Sean's house, and picked her up to come back and talk to the deputy that was there. She willingly, Julie willingly went with you? She did, yes, yeah. She she was crying, saying that she, you know, she wanted to do everything she could to help, and um, mm-hmm. she was convincing Sean uh, to get up out of bed and go with us as well mm-hmm. to help and pretty much tell whatever story she knew he had because she kept yelling at him to get up and, you know, you needed to come and talk to these police officers. Mm-hmm. And he completely refused. But she came with us. Okay. At that point, did you know that she had showed up at your grandfather's house looking to clean it when you picked her up? Um. Yes. Did you ask yep. her about that? What did she say? Yes. My mom asked her about it, and she admitted it and said that, yes, Charles um, told her that, he, that she was supposed to clean and that she was very sorry and very embarrassed and yeah. <laughs> uh, did she say where she saw Charles? Uh, she said that she seen him. That uh, I think Brenda dropped Charles off at her house Friday evening. And Julie's make sure um, we don't use too many pronouns here. Brenda dropped Brenda dropped Charles off at Julie's house. Yes. All right. So were you yes, were you went and got Julie? Um, is where Charles was allegedly dropped off. Yes. Okay. Okay. And and just out of nowhere, Charles says, "Hey, Julie, go over to my uh, my place and clean it." Um, it, it was supposedly that uh, uh, Friday morning, Charles got in contact with Julie and mm-hmm. told her. Um, later in the afternoon that, yeah, that my, my dad wants his house cleaned and uh, to go clean it, and I'll, I'll end up paying you for it. Is Julie in the cleaning business? Uh, no, no. She didn't even have cleaning supplies when she showed up. She showed up empty-handed and with no vehicle. Somebody drove her over there? Mm-hmm. Yep. Somebody drove her over there, and when we asked her who it was, uh, she said that it was uh, Chris. Drove her over there, Chris and Sean. They were riding in one vehicle, dropped her off at the end of the driveway. She walked to my grandpa's house to clean it, and then she had to end up walking like a mile down the road because she kept, after he kicked her out, she kept trying to call them to come back and pick her up, and um, supposedly... Uh, Sean came and picked her up, and as far as what she said is that she, Sean said that um, Charles was with Chris and Brenda, and that they were at their house, and so Sean and Julie went to their own house in River Pine, and then later that evening, uh, Mm -hmm. Brenda supposedly dropped Charles off at Julie's, um, and they were hanging out with there with some people that Julie said she doesn't know and then ended up leaving with those people that she doesn't know. Charles ended up leaving with these people she doesn't know. Mm-hmm. All right, so Julie is allowing people she doesn't know to hang out at her house? Yep, yeah. Okay. And she showed up to clean without any cleaning supplies. Now, uh, not to reveal too much about yourself, but you are in the cleaning business, correct? Yes. Have you ever heard of any real cleaner showing up someplace with any without any 
towels or cleaning supplies or any, you know, stuff to squirt stuff down? Have you ever heard of that in your entire career? Never. No. Nope. <laughs> and, she, and, yeah. and, and, and I'm sure. If you handed, you don't have a job. <laughs> right. Uh, and were you in this business in 2015? Um, oh, goodness. No, I was not. All right. So. So it's not like she was talking to somebody who had been in the business. So she were talk. You, this was before you got into that. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think, and I can ask is: is there anything about that story at the time or now that you believe? No, no. Okay. Um, I I I believe that he was at her house, uh, at Julie's house, mm-hmm. but I don't believe that she left with people that she. No. Well, well, we'll we'll certainly get into that, but you don't believe that mm-hmm. she was over at that house to clean, and you certainly don't believe no. that Charles told her to go over there to clean. No, I don't believe that at all. Okay. And how long? Once again, how long after he disappeared did this happen? Um. Oh, I'm sorry. How long after? He How, did, what happened? The, did did you bring uh, Julie over and she talked to uh, the cops and everything else? How long after? Um, that was so Sunday to Wednesday. Um, so about two, three days. All right, two and so half, very three quickly days after. Yes. So it was October fourth is a Sunday. So you're saying October seventh? Yes. Okay. Do you think? Uh, when you go went over there, do you think that Julie even knew that uh, Charles was missing? Uh, I do. Yeah, I think she knew he was. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay, and I guess the story that she was trying to portray to you is that he disappeared while he went off with these people that she didn't know. Yes. All right, and we have to remember there is proof that whoever Charles was with, that he was alive on that Saturday and he was alive on that Sunday. Yes. All right, we just don't know who he was with. If he was, he could have been by himself. We don't know. We're going to get into that. But whoever he was with, he was still alive. Yes. Okay. All right, let's move on to this. Uh, This uh, October 2nd, this description of Brenda, how... What is the description of her? Because I should uh, admit to the listeners that uh, I've tried to track her down with just this first name. I've been unsuccessful at this point. We're doing this interview on June 28th, 2020. Um, Sean, Julie, and Christopher are are known uh, as far as who, what their full names are, etc. But Brenda is still a little bit of a mystery. How would you describe her? What does she look like? Uh, a heavy set, dark complected woman with yeah, dark hair, dark skin. Mm-hmm. Um, not uh, I guess taller than an average woman, and yeah, and more heavy set. Okay. Uh, so when you say dark complected, dark hair, so this could be Hispanic, it could be Middle Eastern, maybe uh, Greek. Or something, you yeah. know, in the in those like maybe Southern Italian, even maybe something like that. Some yeah. one of those types of ethnicities. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you know if the police ever tracked her down? Um, the the detective said that he did. They did. Okay, well that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, so they must have known her last name somehow. They must have been able to figure out. Um, and what did she have to say? Do you know what she, we know what Julie had to say. We just heard that, you know, she told it to you maybe yourself while you were driving it over, over there to speak to the cops. Do you know what Brenda told the police? Uh, that she knew nothing, that she hadn't seen him for quite a while. Um, and that, yeah, that she knew absolutely nothing and didn't know where he was or where he was that weekend. Nothing. Did she even bring up going over to his place to pick him up? No. No, she said that that was not her. She said that must have been – she said if that was her vehicle, then maybe it was uh, Sean and Chris that picked him up. But she said it was not her. She did not go there. She didn't get out of the vehicle. She wasn't introduced to my grandpa. Nothing. She said that was not her. Even though your grandfather saw Charles get picked up by a woman? Yes. Yep, she came inside, was introduced as Brenda, 
and then um, he left, and then they left. Okay, so she's just outright lying. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And she's saying that she did not spend any time with Charles that weekend. Yep, yeah. She said she spent no time with him. Didn't see him, didn't talk to him, nothing. Okay. All right, so um, at any time that you were to, uh, once again, you or it may be mostly you, your family, when you spoke to Julie, um, didn't track down Brenda, but any of these people, did any of them, while they you were trying to find Charles, did any of these others ever say, hey, we think he went to Jackson, California? Did that ever come out of any of their mouths? Um, no, just no, just Julie. Nobody else but her. Julie said that he possibly went to Jackson. Yes. With these, uh, with these yep. mystery people, allegedly. Yes, yeah, that he had made a comment about going to Jackson mm. to buy a pair of jeans um, or something because he was going to Colorado to see his daughter. Okay. Would he have to go to Jackson to buy jeans, or could he have bought them right around where you all lived? Uh, he, In fact, he bought them somewhere else because he had already bought them about a week before, and um, um, at the time of his, disappear uh, his disappearance, he was actually had them all laid out on his bed and folded and was getting ready to pack for Colorado. So we knew he wasn't going. He had already had clothing. <laughs> brand new clothing that he bought. We knew he wasn't going there for that. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about Jackson, California. How did you find out about this motel in Jackson, California? Uh, when they, when the uh, detectives got his uh, phone records back, we realized where he was. Okay. So there were pings from um, Jackson, California. Mm -hmm. yes. And did you get any credit card? Uh, was he using a credit card? Any, uh, if you know any of his charges or anything, do you know anything about that? Uh, they, I don't believe they said specifically that there were charges. Um, I know they said that they had his signature on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't say anything about ID information, just the fact that it, it that was his signature, and they remember his face. Okay. Uh, so this employee, so how long after this uh, he disappeared? Once again, if we're to take October 4th, uh, 2015, as the disappearance date, how long after mm -hmm. did they manage to get down to Jackson to talk to this employee? Uh, two years later. Two years later. Why yes. did it take so long? Why did it take so long, Amberlynn, if you know? Uh, I don't know. I honestly I don't know why it took them this long. Um uh, it took them this long to do anything. Okay. Um yeah. Okay. Do I you, just okay, pushing you, them. <laughs> okay. I, I, I gotcha. I mean mm -hmm. that I've heard more outrageous things on Unfound, but uh, that's certainly not good. Um, do you know the name? Can you say the name of this motel if you know it? Uh, Best Western. Okay, Best Western Motel in Jackson, California. And we are supposed to believe that two years later some employee remembered Charles? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep, and yep, they remembered him, but the surveillance tape of that specific weekend was no longer available. Well, I'm not surprised. Two years later, that wouldn't surprise me at all. They would not um, uh, surely save that. Uh, yeah. So are they saying that um, Charles, I guess, were to believe, even though it's – I'm not saying he wasn't there. I mean, obviously, if he signed a, p a document there, I guess we have to believe he was there. But are they saying that mm -hmm. he checked out on Sunday? They, yep, they said that uh, he, uh, he checked out on Sunday. Okay. Do they remember him being uh, – once again, I know it's two years later, so a lot of this I'm not sure what to think. But um, mm -hmm. was he by himself? Was he with other people? Was he other men, other women? 
Um, they said that they've seen him with um, one man and one woman. Okay. And do you know what the descriptions of these two people are? I don't. They didn't. They weren't clear or told us whether or not there was a description or what the description was. Okay. So there wasn't a description, for example, with Brenda, dark complected, dark hair, uh, no, late thirties, nothing. early forties, and no, uh, yeah. and Julie's description would be. I think uh, I've seen a picture of her blonde hair in yes. in her twenties. Yes. All right. Yeah. So there's yeah, no younger. so. This employee, if we were to believe that he actually remembers Charles, which I think is a stretch, he says that Charles was with uh, another man and woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Do you know if this employee remembered Charles ever being at that Best Western before? Uh, he said that he had seen him before, and that's how he remembered him. Okay. So I guess what we're saying is Charles spent, uh, I guess, somebody who went down there with somebody down to Jackson. I guess there's proof that he's alive on Saturday. There's alive on Sunday. We have the signature. If we believe it's his signature, uh, he's alive on Sunday morning. He checks out, and then something happens after that. It w would that be a general description of that weekend? Is that yeah. how you understand it? That's how I understand it. Okay. So we have these. So you've already talked about the phone records. Um, you, we of course already talked about some calls that you know about. Uh, have you ever seen the phone records? Uh, partial, yes. Partial. I've seen some of it. Uh, when you say, uh, partial part of it, what does that mean? Uh, what the detectives, uh, showed us, um, they asked me and a couple other family members if, uh, the the phone numbers looked familiar, um, and the numbers that they weren't focused on um, was, like, blacked out. So, yeah, we, we weren't able to – we were only able to see certain numbers that they wanted us to see if we could identify. Did they give you any reason why they blacked out the other numbers? Uh, they said that they, they, they were people that was either family members that they knew – um, had nothing to do with it, or just people that they, um, I guess, crossed off their list altogether. Okay. Do you, so they showed you some of those numbers. Did you recognize any of those numbers? Did you remember any of those numbers to call them? Anything? Nothing. No. Yeah, we, we right. knew none of them. Okay. So they got those phone records, and, man, it would be great to have those records, but it's probably uh, – well, you probably could. I mean, was he on his own plan? Was he on a plan with his his father? How do you, what do you remember about his cell phone? Uh, he was on a like a pay as you go AT and T phone all by okay. yeah, oh, by his own plan. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you got to see the phone records. Not a lot of help. It doesn't sound like you were a lot. No offense, uh, Amberlynn, but it doesn't sound like you were a lot of help to them as far as identifying some of these numbers. Hey, it's, mm -mm. it's not nope. your job to to know who he's calling and everything, but uh, but it did give you, give you the impression that he was alive well into Sunday. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now you had mentioned uh, when you talked to the police about these phone records that this this last call about the number being one off did mm -hmm. the, uh, did that topic come up? Did the police say anything to you about it? Um, uh, yeah, because it, it was a number that they had, uh, like, circled and said mm -hmm. that, um, you know, do you recognize this phone number? Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, we don't recognize it only as the fact that it's one number off from my mom's. And they looked and realized that it, the number saved for my mom, that it was one number off. Um, but they just said that, you know, mm -hmm. they kind of made my mom think that maybe he was in a panic and dialed her phone number rather than looked it up on his phone, but mm -hmm. dialed his phone number, but couldn't. Yeah, who does that? Yeah, 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 that was, right. yeah, that was on. Uh, I've talked about this <laughs> recently. There's been, there was another disappearance that we covered recently, that cell phone information. I talked about this kind of same phenomenon that these days uh, we don't know people's phone numbers. We just know their names on our phones. Even, I think mm -hmm. that would be true in 2015 as well, is that, who dials an actual number anymore? <laughs> Nobody. 
yeah. you know, hardly anybody. Nobody. So, yeah, that, and just that that seems like a little bit of a put on to me, but okay. All right, so that was that the last number ever called dialed on the phone? To your understanding? Yes. All right. Yep, can I understand? Okay. Now they also not only did the phone records, but they pinged his phone. And where did the la- what is the area, um, of of where was it? Where was the last ping? Um, it was in Jackson, um, near, I think, uh, like what we call the Kennedy Mine or Tailing Wheels. Is, um, mm-hmm. I got it right here. It's it, called Kennedy Tailing Wheels Park. Yes. Yes. What what is that? Is that like uh, I guess it's a park, but is it big? Is it small? What do people do um, there? It's very big. Is it? Yeah, it's like it's like some hiking trails, um, mm-hmm. just kind of a scenery type thing, mm-hmm. and and a like a picnic type park, uh, okay. kind of like a historic. Okay. Kind of walking around and yeah. Okay. Uh, have you ever been there? I mean, before Charles disappeared, had you ever been there before? Yes, yeah, yeah, several mm-hmm. times. Okay, and I guess you've been there since? Uh, yeah, twice. Okay. Do uh, – this is a key question here. Uh, did Charles know somebody who lived near that park? Yes. And who was it, or who is it? Um. Uh, it was um, Jay Ball's mother. She lived near there. Okay, so just um, to kind of wrap the, uh, kind of uh, maybe come back around to this, that uh, Jay Ball is the mother of Julie, who is the girl that showed up to clean. Her father's, her, her grandmother lives very close, and I've found the address, uh, very close to this park that you're talking about where this last ping happened. Mm-hmm. And I think there's yes. I think there is reason to believe that Jay Ball also lived near the park uh, at the same time. So that kind of puts it a little bit together. So Julie's saying she doesn't know what happened, but then Charles's phone is pinging right in the area where her father and grandmother were living at the time. Yes, correct. Okay. Was Jay uh, Jay Ball's phone number on the records? Um, not that we recognize and not that we were ever told. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you know, um, do you know if your, uh, Uncle Charles had, was in contact with Jay Ball? And we know something was going on with Charles and Julie, something there, we're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But do you know if Charles was talking to Jay very often or did they keep in contact? Do you know? Uh, as far as I know, like maybe occasionally, um, what we heard was that he had moved, um, like down to I think the Delta or something, and lived on it on his boat. Mm-hmm. Um, so there just wasn't that much contact, as much as like they used to. I mean, maybe a couple times a year, he would Jay would come out and visit, and my uncle would mm-hmm. see him. Okay. So maybe. Charles went over there after he was done at the motel. Maybe he went over there. Maybe. Mm-hmm. We just don't Maybe. Know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, do you know if Jay Ball or his mother have ever admitted seeing Charles that weekend? No. Um, I suppose if we, neither one of them can be found um, by detectives, and uh, we haven't both uh, been able to, yeah. Yeah, well, that's funny because I know where they're living. You might pass that. You might pass that address along to them. I don't. I don't know if I believe. It. I'm not. They surely can't be that incompetent. But that's surely uh, not the case because mm-hmm. I found them pretty quickly. Okay. Um, when was this last ping? Did they give you like a time that it happened? Was it in the afternoon, evening? Did they ever even tell you? I I believe it was in. Um, I want to say the like mid morning to afternoon on. Sunday, I believe. Mm-hmm. I believe. Um, mm-hmm. Or, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. It was later on in the morning. Um, yeah, that I can remember. Okay. So this last yeah. thing obviously was after 
Charles made this phone call and talked to his nephew. Yes. Yes. Okay. All yep. right. And how long did it take them to get these phone records? Two years as well? Yes. Two years. Okay. All right. Just want to talk about the truck for a little bit. Once again, he did not take it. Um, what ended up happening to Charles' truck that he did not take that weekend? Um, my my parents kept it and still have it just in case. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to this. Let's talk about Julie uh, a little bit. Remember, she to remind the listeners, she showed up after Charles left saying she wanted – to clean the place, um, but there is an issue of money. Why don't you – of course, we believe that she wasn't there to clean. Hmm. It could have been a money situation. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, my, uh, my uncle had called my grandpa when he was with Julie, um, I think the day before or even that morning. Um from what my mom tells me is that he called my grandpa to let him know where the rent money was, where he had stuck it. Mm. Um, and then the next thing, yeah, later that day or the, or the next day, I'm not exactly sure when that phone call happened. Um, but she, she had known about the money and where it was hidden. And we have to remember this was the beginning she, of the month, so that's possible. Uh-huh. I, I have to ask, why didn't your Uncle uh-huh. Charles, why did, why did he have to stuff the money somewhere? Why didn't he just give it to his father? Um, Like, I think my grandpa was at home at the time. And, um, I, and he... Let's see, yeah, my grandpa, he... my. Uncle Charles said that he was there at the house with Julie, called my grandpa, said that he was sticking the money at this place. Um, but later on, um, in case he didn't see him because he was going to go help Julie move. But then when my grandpa ended up coming back home, um, Charles was there just alone. And then that's when he said, you know, I'm, I'm about to leave mm-hmm. to be picked up. I'm going to go help Julie move. Um, so that's how... We had we had known that Julie uh, was there at the house when he said that um, you know here's the money underneath the yeah. fountain or wherever they were keeping it and in case you know I'm not here when you get back so um, I, I gotta yeah, ask Amber Lynn, that it, Julie it, was with them I, I gotta ask it seems weird to me that you have to hide money. In your own house, was Charles afraid that somebody's going to break in and steal the money? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it was just the the spot. He'd always, if I'm not home, you know, it's under here. Yeah, I never, I never questioned that <laughs> of why. I mean, I've I've had room. I mean, I, it somewhere I, else. I've uh, rented my whole life. Uh, since 1998, when I moved to Las Vegas, I've had many different roommates, although I haven't had a roommate since 2011. And pretty mm-hmm. much, if we were sharing rent or anything, it's just, you know, usually it's check, but you just put it down there on the kitchen table. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It seems weird. Yeah. I, I mean, cash, some people don't have checking accounts, whatever. That's not as crazy, but stuffing the cash somewhere uh, seems weird when it's just you and your father living there. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I never thought about that. Maybe, maybe he just yeah thought that he was always gonna somehow be ripped off. <laughs> All right, um, I'm, not, I'm sure the listeners are gonna be thinking yeah. long hard about that one, but I think it certainly makes a good argument that Julie wasn't there. Yeah, she was gonna clean. All right, she was gonna clean that money out. Yeah, yeah. Because she knew where it was because she had heard Charles uh, make that uh, statement. And, you know, I, w- I wonder, and Julie showing up like that, maybe she didn't realize her grandfather was home. Yeah, you know, I, don't, maybe, I don't think she did. You know, it might have been that when he answered the phone, she was a little flustered, and so she came up with the cleaning thing because it sounds so stupid. She might have been some yeah. reason it sounds so stupid is because she had to make it up on the spur of the moment. Okay, 
So yeah. uh, so she goes there uh, to clean allegedly, but there's a reason to believe that that she was there to take the money. Of course, she's never going to admit to that. Now, you did say that you got to speak to her a few days later when you were driving her over so the police would talk to her. Um, uh-huh. Did you get to speak to her after that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, my understanding is that she did give her version of what could have happened to Charles. What did she say? Uh, she said that maybe uh, the people that he was with, maybe he OD'd on whatever drug they were doing, and the people panicked mm-hmm. and maybe got rid of his body. But she st- and how long later did you speak to her again? Um, uh, well, we, I mean, we, after the detective left, um, we ended up having to take her back home. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, we, we spoke to her then and, you know, and just kept begging her if you know anything else or, you know, you mm-hmm. know anything, you know, please don't be afraid. You know, we can help you. Don't be afraid to, to tell us or tell the truth. Um, okay, well, maybe I need more. And, maybe I should be a little more clear on this. Uh, mm-hmm. That Wednesday, October seventh, you went and got her. She agreed mm-hmm. to go with you to speak to the police. Her mm-hmm. uh, Sean did not. So she talks to the yeah. police. How how long did she talk to the police that day? Do you remember? Um, like maybe maybe an hour or two. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fairly long. Okay. Um. And then you drove her back to where she lived. Yes, correct. And, and you continued to talk to her about Charles's disappearance. Mm-hmm. And is that when she gave you her theory? Uh, she gave us a theory actually when we picked her up on the way to, to the detective. Mm-hmm. Um, because we had mentioned it to the detective, like you know, hey, she gave this story, and then he asked her about it, and she said, you know, I'm just thinking maybe I'm just trying to help. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, and then I mean, my mom has asked her several times after that, like, you know, do you know if he OD'd? Like, please, you know, you don't even have to give names. We just want to know where he is. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Yeah, she she was just crying and said that still she in, couldn't help us. Still insisting, though, she has no idea who was at her house and who Charles went with. Yes, correct. All right. Have you she spoken no to her? Idea. Have you spoken to her since October seventh, twenty fifteen? Um. Yeah. Uh. I we saw her about two weeks ago. Oh, you did. Working at Walmart. Oh, you yeah, ran her just two weeks ago. She's working at Walmart. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did yeah. Charles did Charles' name come up? Yes. And what'd she say? Yes, my mom my mom asked her if she had heard anything around town or through her friends about Charles and she said no, um and that she's been googling his name to see if there's been any new information. <laughs> okay. And my mom said, Oh, okay, well if there <laughs> you know, if you hear anything you know, please mm-hmm. contact the sheriff. Okay. Um, did she ever? Uh, Charles uh, said he was going to help Julie move that weekend. Did Julie ever move? No, she did not. She still lives where she lived when we first met her. Okay, so she has this. Uh, she has this uh, theory, and in exposing that theory, she admits she knew that Charles was doing drugs. And uh, okay, all right. Um, you said that so. We'll, so that's Julie's story, and that's the, she's stuck to the same story since October seventh. Yes. Okay, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Mhm. Okay. <laughs> now, as far as Brenda goes, uh, she was the one that we believe, or you believe. I'm just believing what you said. Uh, picked up Charles that day. Uh, I guess the police did track her down. Do you know what she said to the police? Uh, that she knew nothing. She knew nothing. She heard mm-hmm. nothing. And that was literally, they said that they had nothing else to talk to her about because she said she doesn't know anything and has nothing to do with his disappearance. Okay. And has she admitted, though, picking Charles up that day? 
Uh, no, no. She won't even admit that. She did. Nope, she will not. She will not admit that. Okay. Next, uh, being that uh, Charles was on parole, uh, I would have thought that the police would be a little bit more on this, being that he's a parolee that went missing. Uh, you might call him a wall or a deserter or something. Uh, did the parole officer, was he concerned about Charles going missing at all? Not at all. <laughs> Not you... at all. He pretty much said, uh, give it a month. I'm sure he'll call you, and when he calls you, let me know. And we have yet to hear. We've never spoken to him since then at all. We've that mentioned was... that several times, that why, if he's on parole, why wouldn't you guys want to look for him? <laughs> mm-hmm. So the last time you spoke to the parole officers was 2015? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a uh, – let's talk about Detective slash D.A. Horn. What do you have to say about him? Oh, he's – he's no good. <laughs> he um, He's not helpful. He – well, first of all, we Why? should explain <laughs> is that at first he was the detective uh, responsible for Charles's disappearance, correct? Mm-hmm, correct. But now he's the uh, district attorney in that same area? Yeah, yeah, he works with the – either he's the, um, the assistant or he works directly with the district attorney um, and, yeah, has been transferred to the district attorney's office. And is no longer a um, a detective. All right, you said that you weren't too impressed by him. Why is that? I uh, he he wouldn't take uh, anything that we said seriously. He wouldn't order for the phone records. He would tell us, um, you know, that my boss hired six other people to uh, you know to put one hundred percent into this case, um, and he ended up taking. Six vacations that year, we nobody ever helped. He would avoid our phone calls, and he just and he would tell us um, to go out and interview people ourselves, and then let him know what they said. Well, that's nice. I mean, I <laughs> I certainly do encourage families to get involved, and I think that you've done a fine job, Amberlyn. But you certainly don't like hearing that from a police officer. Not at all. You know, Not at all. You know, when you go to uh, Little Caesar's Pizza, you don't show up and they say, well, you make the pizza yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what Correct. I mean? Okay. <laughs> all right. And so he's the DA now? And Yeah. And what about uh -huh. who is responsible, if you want to use his or her name, who is responsible for Charles' disappearance now? Uh, Detective Conley. John Conley. And how has he been? Uh, we haven't spoken to him in months. Um, he pretty much the same as uh, Detective Horn. He won't return our phone calls. Um, mm -hmm. We've had to actually call his boss and let him know that, you know, to can you do something about him avoiding us? And then he'll finally call us, but we, we haven't spoken to him in months. The last thing he said was, you know, Nothing new, and that's that's pretty much. And he has nothing to say to my mom anymore. Okay. How long has yeah. he been uh, responsible? I'm sorry, what? How long has he been responsible for uh, Charles's disappearance? When did that get put on his desk? Um, I I want to say about a year and a half, almost two years now. He was actually the original detective put on the um, case for maybe the first six months. And then for about a year, year and a half, we had um, Detective Horn. And then now we have Conley again. Okay. We've mentioned uh, Brenda. Still not totally sure who mm -hmm. she might be. Um, but we have Julie. We've mentioned Julie's man, at least at the time, Sean. Uh, mm -hmm. was, did he end up being interviewed by the police? I know he declined to do it at the time. Do you know if he ever did speak to them? 
Nope. Nope. They said that he, they never spoken to him. Okay. That they never had a reason to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you spoke, we spoke very early on about Chris. Uh, it was portrayed that uh, Brenda and Chris were in a relationship. You even stated that your belief is that after, I guess, Brenda and Chris were an item, that Chris ended up having a relationship with Julie, and it's possible that she had a child by him sometime after, of course, after 2015. Uh, what has Christopher Ross done with his life since 2015? Nothing. Uh, he has, he's gotten himself put in prison. <laughs> well, he's, he's certainly done something. That doesn't mean it was good. Uh, what happened, you know, uh, I guess this is just last year, 2019. W what did he do? What trouble did he get in? Um, he ended up uh, murdering, actually, a local El Dorado County uh, sheriff officer. Sheriff's deputy. Uh, yes. Yep. Yep. He wounded um, a uh, volunteer, and he ended up killing um, a deputy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, by the time that people are hearing our voice, uh, this I think this episode's going to be coming out on July third, twenty twenty. But before that happens, I will have posted uh, Facebook and elsewhere about this article on which Christopher and two other guys um, were charged with murder of this deputy, and it all started with a marijuana dispute. Uh, it sounds like Christopher was the guy who called the deputy to show up. He claimed that somebody ripped weed off from him, and then when the deputy showed up, this shootout happened, and this deputy yes. ended up being um, murdered. And uh -huh. and then I, my understanding is Chris and these other two guys tried to get away, and they got caught. So that is yes. the Christopher Ross that is involved. I'm not saying he caused uh, Charles's disappearance. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. But he is mm -hmm. tangentially connected to the disappearance, even though he might not have he, – he at least knew Charles for sure. Yes, and correct. Was, so we now know that a murderer – granted, he's going to go to trial, but this isn't – we aren't in the legal business. We're in the information business. That a murderer mm – -hmm. Um, knew your uncle Charles. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you know if uh, the people pr uh, responsible are the P is D. A. Horn responsible for the prosecution of Christopher Ross? Uh, I I honestly I don't I do not know that. Okay. I do, don't. Uh, have you alerted? the DA's office that is responsible for Christopher Ross's prosecution, have you alerted them that he knew your Uncle Charles who was missing? Um, I had called them, and they uh, they actually said uh, their supervisor was going to call me back. This was a couple of months ago before we mm -hmm. had, um, like, COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and then since then, it's um, nobody's either in office or they're working from home or like no, I just I can't get a hold of anyone and nobody wants to call me back and I can't leave a message I like, the person that I ended up talking to um so that they were, they would give them the message to call me but overall I have yet I have not got to ask or tell hmm. anyone okay. if you know yeah horn is connected and what that whole situation might uh, be. The California justice system at work, Amberlin? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Well, I think you've <laughs> got to keep on that. That is certainly uh, important. Certainly, certainly Absolutely. important that the people that are doing this know that uh, this guy knew knows or knew a missing person, uh, Charles Thompson. Okay. Um, What's this been like for you? I know emotionally – uh, very difficult, but handling this the, almost the last five years, um, what can you tell the listeners about this experience of just talking to these people, looking into these things, uh, making these phone calls, of course, you know, getting ignored, et cetera. What has that part been like for you the last almost five years? Uh, very frustrating. Um um, yeah, just a lot of frustration with no cooperation and just, I mean, heartache, you know, after heartache and mm -hmm. 
loss of hope. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's been hard. <laughs> yeah. Is this something, um, you know, of course you're trying to, you know, you and I have been talking for a few months now, and uh, of course I'm here Mm -hmm. not just as a reporter but to give you the best advice I can give you, and I'm going to continue to do this even after this uh, interview comes out, et cetera. But has this been just really a lot of just guessing what to do next? How would you explain, you know, know, who to talk to next, how to – who to talk to first, who to talk to next, information, collect, kind of just winging it. Uh, how would you explain it? Pretty much, yeah. It's, yeah, pretty much winging it. Um, I guess trying not to step on anyone's toes is our biggest thing. With anyone that we feel like um, they don't want to help us if we bother them mm-hmm. <laughs> or show concern. Um, as an example? Yeah. Uh, can you give an example? Of um, being careful guess, uh, not to talk, uh, step sorry. on anybody's toes. Just as an example, if you can give one. Um, I guess calling um, uh, Detective Conley every week to see if he knows something. Mm-hmm. Um, he has uh, been kind of clear that uh, when he knows something, he will let us know. Um, it, it seems like that if we, the more we push, um, the more they push back, but not being helpful. Um, they tend to ignore us more. The more we call, they want to ignore us more and help us less. They were very helpful in the beginning and not helpful at all right now. Hmm. And, um, yeah, my mom's scared that if, if she makes them mad by calling, that they will completely forget about his case. Well, I can tell you that on that note, I can tell you that many of my guests have certainly expressed that, that they are afraid of um, ticking the police off and then the file will get put to the bottom of the pile. Uh, yeah, I want you exactly. to know that uh, – and I I am certainly uh, a fan of working with the police. However, I know that disappearances, frankly, that are five years old are not a concern of theirs. And the listeners who listen to the program know that I've stated this before publicly. It's just not a concern. Um, And it has nothing to do with anything that Charles was involved in. It doesn't matter that he was into drugs or hanging out with the wrong people. That's just the way it is. Um, Yeah. That's just the way it is. Um, Having said that, you know, what I've always counseled is to be nice but firm. You say mm-hmm. thank you, you say please, but there's that, you know, tone in your voice. You know. Yeah. And because it doesn't <laughs> yeah. help to swear at them, uh as I've stated on the the live show that I do on Wednesday nights, uh it it doesn't make any sense to take them to court uh, as has been done here in Florida with uh, the Cassie family taking the Orlando Police Department to court and suing them or those things in my opinion, it's a big waste of time. You need them. You can't uh-huh. arrest anybody. They are the only ones who have the power of the state to put anybody in handcuffs and read them Miranda rights and et cetera. So you need to stay yeah. on their good side, but that doesn't mean you just take whatever they have to give either. You know, don't kiss yeah. their, don't kiss their butts. Uh, you just be nice but firm. You know that that's yeah, you true. know that that's uh, that's what I always. Say and you know you keep on them. You certainly don't go as some families go years without ever talking to the, you know to the, the, the oh, no. you know what I mean. Yeah, that does yeah happen. I won't let them forget. <laughs> uh, you know that does happen. So okay. yeah, yeah. But uh, you know I I think what you're also saying is that although a lot of people you know wonder what it would be like to be a detective or something like that, it's really not that fun, is it? Especially when it's a person that you love trying to figure out what happened. It's not that fun. Yeah, no. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, emotionally, how has uh, your family handled this? I I think that the people have heard your emotions uh, during this interview, but yeah. what about your mother? And, um, of course, most importantly, uh, you know, Charles's father, who your grandfather, who can't be too young, uh, how has he handled yeah. this? 
Um, he's not handled it good at all. He, um, yeah. he just wants to find him, let, or at least know what happened to him before he passes away. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mom, she, you know, she can talk about it, but she pretty much just, she doesn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's and she cries every time and yeah. you know, it's yeah, it's been very, very hard for them and they um they actually recently last week finally got to order him a headstone. So that's at least a, a way of them moving on. Even though they we still don't know where it is. So but they're mm. they're trying. <laughs> he has not been uh declared deceased. No, no, we have to wait two more years. Um, okay. um, but the people, luckily, we don't get a death certificate, um, but we're allowed to at least get a headstone. Okay. I should have asked you when we were talking about uh, the park where his last ping occurred. Do you know if they've ever uh-huh. been done? They've ever done any searches uh, in that park? I've never been there. You have. You said it's large. Uh, Ever any searches done in that area over the last five years? Um, Detective Horn said that he drove out there and kind of walked around and realized that it was uh, um, just flat area that, like, I mean, if if anything happened there, you would be able to find someone. And beyond that is a homeless camp. Um, But he didn't speak to anybody. He just walked around there and, and then ended up leaving and said that, again, it's Amador County side. It's not his jurisdiction. Um, mm-hmm. If he was to speak to somebody, he would need permission or have a detective from Amador County um, go and interview people, or we can interview them ourselves. But as far as going out there, that's as much as I know. Detective Horn walked around for a little bit and left. All right, so no searches done there. And on top of that, no. they claimed that they didn't even know that Jay Ball and his mother lived right down the street. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you think that the police, um, do they know who these mystery people are that Julie's talked about? Or do you think that the police uh, completely doubt her story totally about other people? Picking? Um, what do you think? I think they're choosing not to believe her. Um or pursue anything because they're pretty much saying, oh, that, you know, she's just saying she doesn't know them. We're going to go with that. Brenda says she has nothing to do with it. She doesn't know anything. We're going to go with that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think they're just, whether okay. or not they think people are lying, they're just not okay. caring so what, enough to so tell the stories. All right. So what you're saying is if Julie is telling the truth, that he, I'm not saying that she doesn't know who they were, but if Julie is telling the truth, that some other person who's not been uh, mentioned, Chris, Sean, Julie, Brenda, if it was some other couple or men or women, whoever, uh, it, if they exist, uh, the police have not tracked them down, to your knowledge. Yeah, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. All right. Um do you have a uh, a website or a Facebook page set up for your Uncle Charles's disappearance? I do. Um, I have a Facebook page. It's um, I think it's just missing persons. Um, it's attached to my um, I think my personal Facebook page and my uh, my business mm-hmm. uh, Facebook page. Um, and it, yeah, kind of giving the information about his. Um, disappearance, and then I, I encourage other people if they have stories or they want to, you know, share their missing family members and get that story around. Um, I did make a page. Okay, well, uh, why don't you give it out? So you just go by your uh, name then, Amberlyn Rose. They just people would go to your profile, or please explain that. Um, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you'd go to. Um, yeah, my personal Facebook uh, profile. Um, it's actually Amberlyn Rome, R O M E. And then, um, yeah, it's a uh, a page link 
I have off of mine. It's uh, called Missing Person. Okay. I will surely find that and link to that. So what you're saying is you haven't set up a, a traditional, maybe what we might call a traditional Facebook page? or um, Not like an account. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, not okay. like a separate account, just yeah, okay. just a page. Okay. All right. I will I will make sure I find it. I'm sure you can send me a link to it and we'll make sure that it is posted everywhere before uh everybody hears us talking on uh July third. I will make sure uh that that happens. Okay. Okay. And uh any final words before we complete this interview, Amberlyn? Um, no. Just that if anyone hearing this that has information um, to contact me or our local um, sheriff's department in El Dorado County, um, and I just want to say thank you to you, and I appreciate anyone that can help at all. And our whole family appreciates any help that we've already received, and just I am so grateful that somebody's listening. We're very welcome, Amberlyn. Uh, I've said this many times. This is what we do. Uh, we, you know, I do the interviews, but I have assistants that help me um, in making sure you know everything gets done, and we just do the best, you know, just do the best we can. We understand that these disappearance cases, missing persons cases, are some of the toughest in all of uh, law enforcement. They're the toughest part. They're t they're harder than murders and finding out who serial killers are, et cetera. They're very, very difficult, uh, especially in a situation like uh, your Uncle Charles where he goes to another town and we don't know who he's with and his phone pings and nobody wants to do a search. It it you know it makes it very difficult. It, 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 does, it does. Yeah. You know. If, you know. We've covered over 170 of them, and um, everyone is difficult in its own way. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I thank, but I thank you for joining me on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Amberlyn Rome, niece of Charles Thompson. I thank her for joining me and all of you on the program. After doing this program for almost four years now, there's just about nothing more saddening than hearing about nice, friendly, funny people whose lives have been put into turmoil by drugs. This is what sounds like happened with Charles. Granted, they're the ones who choose to do them, and they have to live with the consequences. Yet their families suffer as well. But it sounds to me like Charles found some way to manage that fine line between his drug life and his family one. So, what do we make of all of this? Can we believe the employee who wasn't questioned until two years later, but who insists he saw Charles with a man and woman? Is it some kind of coincidence that Charles's phone pinged very close to where an old friend of his lived? And what could have gone wrong between the phone call Sunday morning and Charles coming back to Fair Play? You can answer those questions for yourselves. And I'll be writing about my own opinions and theories at the private blog on Patreon. But here are the facts that cannot be denied. Julie, the young woman who was asked by Charles, <clears throat> to clean his house after he left that Friday, she is the daughter of Jay Ball. And Jay Ball was friends with Charles. And Jay lived in a home with his mother very close, within about a thousand feet of where Charles's cell phone pinged for the last time. Not to mention, and to illustrate this even further, Julie tried to clean Charles's home in fair play. His phone last pinged in Jackson. The distance between those two locations is 28 miles. What are the odds that a daughter tries to clean the home of a guy, then two days later, 28 miles away, that guy's phone pings within a quarter mile of where her father lived? 
Maybe this episode should have been called House Jackson, California. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've been listening to Unfound.